So the question's been raised about hip thrusts. Who had that question? David. Yeah. David, what's the question, though? So I was wondering, you see now an exercise called hip thrust. You didn't see it 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have no clue what, what the exercise does, and I would like to know what, what's the impact of that exercise, Excellent. short term and long term. So when I came in industry professionally in 1980, and I looked at the books written at that time, Bill Pearl, um, Dr. Squat, Hatfield, all references, both in lay publications, Iron Man, you know, good stuff, and the few books that we published today, just talk about the lower body, the legs, it was a leg day. Nobody ever separated anything about the legs, it was just a leg day. At the same time, the upper back was the upper back. No one ever separated horizontal pulling, vertical pulling over. But that changed when I released the lines of movement concept in the late 1990s to the, to the, to the world. I'd been working on it for over 10 years. And because it was, it was grabbed so quickly and published by others with no reference to the origin, the intent was lost and some of the well, one word was changed. One word was changed. So quad dominant was slipped down to to, to knee dominant. Um, so uh, until I split the lower body, that wouldn't have happened, so to speak. I then popularised a number of control drills. Now, many of them, not all of them, many of them were already in the therapy domain, like the external leg rotation, I just gave that word. Um, some I experiment with and, and created, whether or not someone 20, 30 years ago had come up with the same thing, I don't know, but they, I didn't get them from anyone, I, I, I innovated them myself. Combination, but let's, let's take the external leg rotation, which some people call the clamshell, for example. That's a therapy exercise, it wasn't that day, but nobody in the gym was doing it. So the next thing I did was I not only created the awareness between the, the hips and the quads, and therefore created two groups of exercises, I also gave options. Because when I created my two groups of exercises, it was readily apparent to me that I had a lot of quad options and very few hip options. So I went looking, and I took some from the therapy field, and I innovated some, because I needed to have at least an equal number of, in both columns, generally speaking. So that was the next evolution, the suggestion that we could do single joint exercises, open chained, as in lying on the ground, things like that. <coughs> Now, when they became accepted, then there was an overreaction to them. When dogging extensions, which I call them, which is merely on the ground extending leg backwards, or external leg rotations of pant shells were promoted in, say, Team Ag, now Team Nation, in, in my 1999 articles, my 2000 articles with sample programs in it, the editor. I was brave to publish them. I was scared to, to, to publish them because at that time, the 1990s was, was the first decade of acceptance of strength training and, and it was like the brakes had been taken off and everyone wanted to lift heavy. It was like an exuberance of load. And here's me suggesting forget load and just use your body weight. So there was a lot of, you know, I, I think they did, the magazine did it because they were happy to risk it and do something different. It was a bit different. Um, but the bottom line is, if you want to, understand how weird that was at the time. Look at the wording in the introduction by the editor. It's not like, you know, I know it sounds really weird and there's no load, but just give it down because you're going to find out it's really going to give you muscle fatigue, etc. Et so people then, a uh, few people tried it and, tr and those who did the limping program and similar can really remember. Like a lot of people now 20 plus years later saying, you know, I remember your limping program. That was, a, that was the first of these kind of exercises. And it wasn't immediately embraced. I'm sure some people said, look, that's a Jane Fonda exercise. I mean, it was. I took Jane Fonda exercises, so to speak, I mean, so to speak, and brought them into the gym. When those exercises became more accepted and more people started doing them, you had to reinvent the wheel, didn't we? It wasn't good enough to use body weight. This, this is America, God bless America. What do we need to do? We have to add load. We just can't use external light. We, we, can, we can't marry that with a conventional squat or a deadlift. We have to innovate. Now, my control concept, and this is another innovation, the idea of activating the muscles before you go into training, which is now pretty common in the world, but I know, you know, not, a, not enough people appreciate where it came from, was never intended to be loaded. For me, there's a load limit to, an ex, to a single joint exercise. For me, an external rotation of the upper arm 
and there's a story to that as well, but we won't go there, was never intended to be heavy load. Because there's only so much load a small muscle can use. So when I see isolated exercises used with maximal loading, I've got some question marks about them. Like, how is that possible? So for me, the hip thrust is an acceptance of what I brought to the market, which, hey, let's focus on the, on the awareness that it's hip dominant, right, in addition to quad dominant, number one. Number two, unique, some single joint or, or, or double joint ex exercises, and that's great, and an embracement of that, but then an overreaction to go into loading. So what are my main concerns with loading? When you're loading any movement, it raises a question about what muscle groups we're using. Now, since my, since my publication of these concepts some 20 years ago, with the, things have got worse, not better. So I actually have gone from having a one-to-one -one ratio between quad and hip. And most people I work with are on a three-to-one, five-to-one, or a ten-to-one hip to quad. Most people I start working with don't get any quad for three months. So if you place all exercises on a continuum, another concept I introduced, so if you look at my 1998 How to Write Strength Training, now Volume 1 of the Inking's Guide to Strength Training, you'll see I place everything on continuums, which, which wasn't being done before. If I get all my hip-dominant exercises and I place them on the continuum, which of my hip-dominant unilateral or single or double joint exercises has the greatest quad involvement? Is it the clamshell or is it the single leg or double leg supine hip thigh extension, which is basically the hip thrust? Which of those two has more quad involvement? Clamshell or lie on the back, push my ass in the air? Push my ass in the air because I'm extending my knee at the same time. So that exercise is actually on the quad dominant end of a hip dominant column of a continuum. At best, you're doing 50 50. In some people, you may actually be doing 60% quad, 40% hip. Now, I haven't seen any EMG analysis of it, but what I'm saying from my experience and experience with athletes is that I actually drop that exercise out if I've got a concern that they're already too quad dominant. So the reason you can lift more on that exercise is because it allows you to use your quads as well. Now, I initially described it as quad dominant and hip dominant, two big muscle groups. Now, when I said hip, I wasn't talking about the joint. I was talking about the musculature of the hip. But because the people who plagiarised my work didn't take time to look at the good explanation, which I did in many places, including my How to Teach book in 2000, I explained my rationale. So they thought, well, Ian's an idiot. He said quad dominant. He should be saying knee dominant because that's opposite to hip dominant. But I wasn't talking about the hip joint. Because the squat and the deadlift both use the hip joint. The word hip joint and knee joint don't separate those two genres. They both involve knee extension and hip extension. So what I'm talking about is the musculature responsible. So moving forwards, there's still not enough hip work in, in most training programs. And then you take that one, which is on the far end of the continuum. Now let's go a step further. There's another concept in sport called transfer. I've been writing about it for a few decades. Now, I know this has been addressed using different terminology, you know, the vectored concept, etc. There's a time and place for specificity. Now, if I'm lying on the ground and I'm doing a clamshell or what I call external leg rotation, I acknowledge that's not specific, but you don't have to be specific all the time. I leave my, specific, my more specific work to the more loaded stuff. Now, if you've got a loaded hip thrust, where's the transfer there? Now, to answer that question, one of the earlier proponents of the exercise created some research, which purportedly at the time demonstrated that it was equal in horizontal displacement as was a deadlift or a squat. Now, Research since has questioned that conclusion. My lay coach mind says that if I'm driving my forces at a 90 degree angle to my body, that might contribute to horizontal. It's not going to contribute to vertical, and that was acknowledged. But let's look at the specificity of the body position. If you want to do a study talking about specificity, I really want to see 
some specificity in body position. Now, one of the reasons I like the deadlift over the squat for some sports, such as the start and the sprint, is because it's got greater joint angle specificity. It's more similar to this. Absolutely. Now, there are lesser sports that have joint angle specificity to hip thrust. Now, you could say maybe BJJ on your back and off your back. You know, you, you can find sports or positions in sports, great. But it's nowhere near as relevant in sport across the board. It's not specific from a joint angle perspective. So number one, we question increased quad involvement. We question specificity. Now let's talk about number three. When I entered the industry in 1980, and I read the magazines and the books, there was a word called a hyperextension. Now people don't know, don't remember those days unless you were in the industry in the 70s and the 80s. And I said to myself, in the early 80s, I said, I don't like that word, because what is the word hyperextension? That's a back extension, by the way. What does it say? Extend past parallel of the body. So I introduced the word back extension. And if you look at my program designs in the, in, in the early 1980s, you will see that word. Now, unlike the, the fake functional experts who, wouldn't, who couldn't show their 1990s programs, whose programs before they saw my work were reflective of mainstream values, and after they saw my work, suddenly became more functional. You can see in my program design, for example, a 1983 booklet I wrote on, 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 on strength training design, where I, where I use that word back extension. So why don't I want people to extend into a hyperextension, generally speaking? Now, if you're in the circus, yes. If you're a trapeze artist, yes. But generally speaking, why don't I want trunk extension? Because it jams the lumbar and it jams the SI joint. Now, this concern exists also in hip thigh extensions. What I call supply and hip thigh extensions, what some people call hip thrust. But listen, I'm the person who brought this movement into the weight training genre. So I've got a bit of a feeling for it. I feel I've got a bit of a right to have a comment on it. Although I've never really commented much since this, this craziness began 15 years ago. So that position on the floor could have a hyperextension of their... When the hip... When the hip, in, in relation to the line from the shoulder to the knee, when it gets to a certain point, you need to have a really healthy lower back or else you're going to aggravate your lower back. Mm -hmm. Now, for some people, you say one of you, your knee is here and your line of your body is here. Mm -hmm. For some people, it's here. Maybe some people, it's here, a smaller percentage. But nobody apart from that, generally speaking, unless you're a circus performer. The majority of people need to be very careful with their end point and their acceleration into the end point. And these are the, these are the risks produced by that movement. That's, I've seen that in, in, the, in the gym, when people actually do that, the hip thrust, mm -hmm. not even weighted by trainers. They actually tell the trainers, I can't do that because it's hurting my back. So Absolutely. That's what they say. And if you don't cue someone before yeah. you start the movement, they're going to hurt their back. Right. Now, I'm sure the, the defenders of the hip thrust are going to say, oh, we do that, we do that, but let's, let's, let's get real. There's a risk, and I'm not saying risks uh, are irrelevant. Life is risky, so there's a time and place to take a risk. But the majority of people don't deserve that risk. It's not, they're not informed on that risk. The final point I want to touch on is loading on your thigh. Like, I know someone will vent a machine one day, and in fact, I think someone involved in the promotion of did, but the bottom line is, do you want to have a loaded bar on your quadriceps? Well, listen, I don't want it, but if you want to knock yourself out. There's some, there's some, there's some issues there. So we've gone through a few things. <clears throat> in my opinion, the introduction, the promotion, and the prevalence of this movement is one, a human overreaction, <coughs> and secondly, an attempt by some to position them their significance in the world attached to our new innovation. Quite simply, you do not have to load everything. And this is, a, this is what the world struggle with. Because when I, I watched, I watched this Jane Fonda-like movement be slowly accepted, and I, I, I liked that it was, but then I went from that to being, okay, well, let's, let's Americanize it. Let's throw some bar, let's throw some weight on that shit. Like, unless we've got six plates stacked either side, we're not a man. Like, really? 
So this this whole focus on loading introduces a introduces a whole new group of problems. But that, that's the background. That's my pers perspective on it. And and you don't have to agree with me, but it, it, it'd be difficult to deny that I've been watching this for a long time. And in fact, I'm the person that introduced the general movement, I created the popularity of it. I didn't I didn't I didn't create the, that that movement per se. As I said, it's been in aerobic classes. And I, I, maybe I took it in an aerobic class. But I had to look. Oh, this is this is why I'm so intimate with it. I had to scramble to find exercises for the hip dominant column because in those days the quad dominant column was really long, but the hip dominant column stopped here. So I had column depth like this, and I had to have pair because in those days I was thinking one to one. And in summary, now I'm, I'm no longer thinking one to one because the world is so messed up when they get to me that I've got to go three to one, five to one, ten to one, or zero. So like, no. Zero quad, which is what I typically the majority of athletes I start with now, unfortunately, don't get anything quaddy for the first few months. Now the world's not ready for that, but the world wasn't ready for me telling them to, to do a supine hip fire extension in the 1990s either. But one day the world will be, and I'm sure someone from Perform Worse will come to and say, "Yeah, that's mine." I write a book about that. <laughs>